Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Amanda Jadro, Portfolio Manager with TRICOM. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, TRICOM was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Michael Gatzler. Mike is a founding partner of Clark & Gatzler Attorneys at Law. Mike has been providing legal and practical human resources advice to a wide range of employers for nearly 20 years, including 10 years as general counsel of an HR firm that provided temporary staffing, executive recruiting, HR consulting, and integrated HR services throughout the U.S. With their real workplace experience and the focused mission and structure of their firm, Clark & Gatzler delivers large law firm quality and expertise with small firm focus at affordable rates. Unlike most law firms, their attorneys also have decades of in-house experience, so they understand the practical realities of applying legal advice. Clark & Gottsler clients range from large multi-state employers to startup businesses and represent all major industries and nonprofit sector. Clark & Gottsler's mission is to provide sound, practical advice and opinions while maintaining the highest standards of communication and responsiveness. The staffing industry is tasked with finding, screening, and placing qualified candidates for host employers. Determining best practice uh, background screening policies to balance your safety and compliance requirements can be a complex legal predicament. In today's edition of the Industry Insider Webinar Series, Mike will cover Employers Balancing Act, working with background check providers and FCRA, use of criminal history, EEOC guidance and recent activity, ban the box laws, and building the right background check process. By the end of this session, you'll know the best practice screening policies that are recommended by legal professionals with human resource expertise. If you have questions during the presentation, Please utilize the Q&A or the chat feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback by completing a short exit poll. Please join me in welcoming Mike. Thank you, Amanda, and good afternoon or good morning to our attendees. Um, and thank you to TRICOM for producing this fantastic series of webinars. Our law firm greatly appreciates the opportunity to participate. Before we begin, um, a, a quick note about our law firm and our mix of clients. Amanda mentioned a little bit about it. Um, I'd also add it's very relevant here today for, for this audience, the fact that we represent and advise more temporary staffing and recruiting companies than companies from any other industry. So uh, three of the four attorneys here have been in-house lawyers uh, at such firms at different points in their careers. So uh, I think that explains uh, why we have that mix of, of clientele. So thanks again to TRICOM for the opportunity here. So um, our agenda today um, is fairly broad. I'm going to try and move pretty quickly through the material and finish in time uh, so that we have opportunities for some Q&A um, and some comments. So as Amanda said, you can submit your comments or questions during the course of the presentation as well, and we can collect those as we go. But for the most part, we're going to try and address them once I get to the final slide. So as you can see from the agenda here, um, we're going to talk uh, about federal laws and state and local laws. It seemed like the best way to organize the material, and then we'll talk a little bit about building the right background check process. 
So um, right out of the gates, um, this is a fantastic topic um, for staffing companies. Um, it's a fascinating area from the legal side of things because you have this balancing act that employers um, must closely um, practice every day. So on the one hand, you've got exposure as an employer if you put someone out to work and you haven't done your due diligence in terms of you know, checking their background, completing certain types of checks and screens. You know, if you, if you hire someone and you haven't done a, that type of work uh, in advance, you're putting your organization at risk. So those are negligent hiring claims uh, most, most, cert, uh, most occasionally when, when something like that occurs. Um, and you also our slide reminds us all that there's also the possibility of reputational harm um, financial harm, et cetera. Uh, so that's on the one hand. So that really counsels and suggests that staffing companies should regularly use a pretty broad range of background checks and screens. On the other hand, the, the other side of the balancing act is that we must comply with a variety of laws. And in the world of background checks, it's really a patchwork of different laws and regulations. It's challenging as a result for employers to comply with them. There are differing laws. Sometimes they're inconsistent with one another. Um, sometimes they have different terminology. So there, there unfortunately are many surprises for employers on the compliance front when it comes to background checks and screens. And finally, one of the last challenges is the reality that this is an area of employment in HR law that's regulated at all three levels of government, federal, state, and local. And we'll talk about that more as we go through uh, the slides today. So at the federal level, we've got, and you're probably all very familiar with Title VII and the other federal anti-discrimination laws. And maybe surprising to some folks is the fact that none of those federal laws actually prohibit discrimination on the basis of uh, criminal history, on the basis of arrest or conviction record. Uh, it's just not there. Of course, that prohibition on that type of discrimination does exist at, in some states and in some localities. Nonetheless, the federal EEOC as an enforcement agency has taken quite an interest in employers' use of criminal background checks, even though there isn't a federal law that addresses or prohibits the use of arrest or conviction records. So what's the story here? Why is the EEOC so interested um, when they're not tasked with enforcing a law that has that discrimination prohibition? Well, the answer is, the concern about disparate impact when employers are using that information, criminal history, as part of their background check process, um, there is a possibility that the use of that information in a certain way could have a disparate impact on the basis of race or national origin. And those, as we all know on the call today, are uh, recognized as protected traits or characteristics under federal anti-discrimination law. So in the EEOC's mind, they should care. And uh, they are much more in tune with and following and um, investigating, auditing employers on this front. So back in April of 2012, they issued a formal en uh, enforcement guidance available uh, on their website that deals with the employer use of arrest and conviction records. Um, and it's, it was a, caught a few employers uh, by surprise. The guidance is very uh, lengthy. It's 50 plus pages. It's quite detailed. Um, and the EEOC sets forth in the guidance its expectation of what employers need to do if they want to use criminal background checks as part of their their screening process. So 
at the very highest level, the EEOC's expectation is employers are only going to use criminal history if it's job-related and consistent with business necessity. So um, they, on this slide here, there are, there are three primary takeaways from their lengthy guidance are, number one, that individualized assessments are required, which means, uh, frankly and practically speaking, a very lengthy process potentially for employers that use criminal history as part of the background check. Uh, process. So in the eyes of the EEOC, again, this is a guidance document. It doesn't carry the formal weight of federal law, um, but courts will generally defer to enforcement agencies. So it's worth paying attention to what the EEOC thinks. Um, and on this point, they think every individual candidate or employee needs to be assessed separately on their own in light of the criminal history that they may have. So that's point number one. Point number two, they are incredibly skeptical of blanket prohibitions um, on criminal history. So you may have clients um, who still tell you, please don't send us anybody that has any felony convictions. In the eyes of the EEOC, that is per se unlawful. Uh, and the EEOC will bring its own lawsuit against employers that have that type of a policy or practice. If the EEOC becomes aware of it, um, they are increasingly aggressive to um, talk to, uh, that's a euphemism, <laughs> talk, talk to such employers that have, a, have that kind of a rule. So that's an example of a blanket prohibition that's um, very likely to result in either the EEOC bringing a lawsuit against you or your client or, um, uh, you know, a plaintiff, a private plaintiff um, bringing a lawsuit against you. Um, and then third and finally, the EEOC guidance, and this is where most of the 56 pages comes into play, provides a, a helpful list of what the EEOC thinks are relevant criteria for an employer to analyze when they're looking at criminal history, when they're considering an applicant's criminal history. So on this slide, we've kind of categorized um, some of the criteria that the EEOC guidance goes through. Um, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but the point is that it can be a very time-consuming process, particularly if uh, you as an employer do what the EEOC recommends, and that is go through an individualized assessment for, for each candidate. And the last note here on these criteria, the EEOC, unfortunately, um, though this list of criteria is, is somewhat helpful for employers to have, it's a nice reference point. I will certainly grant the EEOC that. On the other hand, the EEOC did not suggest or in any way indicate in the guidance any limits on any of these criteria. So, you know, when you consider, for example, uh, how long ago the offense occurred, the EEOC doesn't kind of tip its hand and say, we think it would be reasonable if the cutoff time frame was X number of years or months. They just, they don't go that far. Um, so that can be both good and bad for employers that are using criminal history as part of their background check process. At the end of the day, what that means is it's really up to you as, a, as an employer to determine what those limits are going to be for each of those criteria. So the, the, the next federal law that implicates background checks and screens is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, or the FCRA, which just very quickly has been around a fair amount of time and really wasn't viewed as um, a source of employment law regulation until the late 1990s when it was amended in a way that made it suddenly very relevant for employers and um, the companies that employers use 
the third-party companies that employers use to, to collect certain types of background information and, and investigative information. So um, the scope of the law, very simply, is if, if you as an employer are relying on a third-party CRA, as they're called, a consumer reporting agency, to gather applicant background information and, and you're not collecting it yourself in-house as an employer, that federal law is going to apply. And the law is very unique, and, uh, and I mean that in a negative way for employers, um, in that it's, um, it's, it's very technical and specific about certain steps that must be followed. It's a very um, process-oriented piece of law. It's really about is the employer giving the right notices, disclosures um, at the right time? and in the right manner with the right language. So information typically gathered and reported when you're using a third party credit reporting agency, you know, it can be credit information, you know, financial credit information. Uh, more typically it's, it's criminal background information or education verification. If you're relying on um, a third party provider, a third-party CRA, to gather any of those uh, types of information, this federal law applies to you. So in short, um, the primary responsibilities for you, um, and it, this, these are responsibilities that do fall to you as the employer, even though you have contracted with a third-party credit reporting agency, at the end of the day, this is your responsibility as the employer. Um, and again, as you see at the bottom of this slide, it's really about taking certain procedural steps at the right time. Certain disclosures and reports must be given um, with enough notice, um, opportunity at the right time, et cetera. So um, Tricom had a seminar, I believe it was last month, that went through some of the detail uh, detailed requirements that the Federal um, Credit Reporting Act requires, and I recommend that you review that um, that webinar, which is recorded on their website very conveniently for all of us as well if you want the specifics. Um, one of the other primary employer responsibilities of the Fair Credit Reporting Act is if you as the employer decide to take adverse action as to a, an applicant or a candidate, meaning you don't extend them a job offer or you withdraw a conditional job offer maybe that you gave them, um, based in whole or in any part on the information that the third party credit reporting agency provided back to you. And that triggers under this law the adverse action process, which is described on this slide here for you. Um, you have to provide the applicant a copy of the background check report that you used, uh, a copy of the FCRA summary of rights. Um, you typically have to give, well, it's recommended, it's not in the statute, that's why the asterisk is there on number three. Uh, you have to give them a pre-adverse action letter that says, dear applicant, um, we are considering intending to take adverse action as to your employment, your candidacy here, based on the contents of the enclosed report, um, please review it for accuracy um, and you know respond to us or the credit reporting agency within X number of days. And kind of by default over the years, um, most employers and most third-party CRA firms have defaulted to the five-day the five-day period. Then if there is no response from the applicant after the five-day period to dispute or correct the report, the employer can take final adverse action, um, but then has to issue another letter, the final adverse action letter, and it needs to contain very specific additional information. Um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act is, has been um, in the news a lot uh, of late, really, the last two to three years because um, it is an employment law that based on how it's 
organized and how liability is found as to an employer, it's very inviting of class action lawsuits. It's a statute that is very um, formulaic in determining the penalties owed by an employer that violates it. And so it provides a, a private right of action, as noted at the bottom of this slide, meaning um, an aggrieved applicant or employee can, can take a, an employer directly to federal court. Um, it, that person doesn't have to go to an administrative enforcement agency first. Um, and it's relatively easy to aggregate multiple allegedly aggrieved applicants uh, into a class and bring a class action against that employer. So that's why the Fair Credit Reporting Act has been increasingly in the news over the last three to four years. Um, we've seen an explosion in the number of Fair Credit Reporting Act lawsuits uh, as a result. So um, it's very easy to unintentionally violate the Fair Credit Reporting Act. If one of your notices includes uh, language or disclaimers that it shouldn't, if some of the notices aren't issued in the proper format, if they're not standalone documents, um, and penalties are just multiplied uh, across the number of applicants that got that, that received that defective notice or disclosure, resulting in very significant um, penalties and exposure. The numbers multiply very quickly for employers in those types of situations, and that tends to uh, attract certain types of plaintiffs and plaintiff law firms, as you might imagine. So here are here's just a hand two, two very quick examples of literally hundreds of Fair Credit Reporting Act uh, cases um, in the last few years. Um, and I, I think you'll notice just from that very first case summary here on this slide, it's not just small employers that maybe don't have a robust compliance function that are, that are getting caught in this this web of compliance um, and, and confusion in terms of technical requirements under the Act. It's big name employers that have large in-house legal departments um, and, and very capable HR departments, et cetera. So Dish Network is, is just one example. Um, there, there are several websites, by the way, and we've linked to one of them there on this slide, to, um, that are devoted exclusively to tracking uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act class action lawsuits. Um, that's how prevalent they've become, unfortunately, for employers. Um, I'm uh, a Wisconsin attorney, and there's been a lot of activity here in our state from a single plaintiff. Um, he's really what we describe as a professional plaintiff. It's, it's his job, and he's admitted, admitted as much in deposition. It is his job to sit at home all day and apply online uh, with, with various employers across the country. Um, and this person, by the way, though a non-attorney, is, is well-versed in the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, and he just applies online and, and looks for defective notices, uh, you know, waivers, um, authorization forms, et cetera. And, um, you know, he does take screenshots of the online process and then um, sends them to his attorney and, and they send a demand letter to the, uh, to the employer at issue. And he's been very successful, as you can see, um, and he continues to be, to be very active. So, um, and unfortunately for employers um, and credit reporting agencies, this particular person from Wisconsin is far from the only one. So that's pretty scary stuff uh, if you're relying on a third party credit reporting um, agency to help you out with gathering background checked information, right? So the good news, I'll finish this on a potentially very positive note. The US Supreme Court issued a 
pretty important decision at the, the end of May this year about the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And it, in effect, um, it, it raised the bar for plaintiffs who are claiming um, harm under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So they, they can't just allege a theoretical injury um, and proceed into, you know, proceed to trial on that basis. They, they have to demonstrate now a concrete injury, um, which is a higher standard um, than previously understood under Fair Credit Reporting Act claims. So the Spokio decision is a very favorable one for employers under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It is so recent, however, uh, that the extent of that favorability remains to be seen, but it's something to keep an eye on. So that's the federal law in a nutshell. And then, as I mentioned at the outset, maybe the most challenging component of background check compliance more broadly is the fact that state and local laws have exploded um, over the last 10 years. And we now have many states across the country and, and many localities uh, that have gotten in the game, so to speak, of background check regulation. So we generally categorize those state and local laws into these three buckets that you see on the slide here. We've got state level credit protection laws. That would be um, you know, a state level FCRA. California's uh, the best example of that. Um, and it's got even more procedural hurdles and hoops for California employers to comply with. Um, the second bucket of state and local laws for background check regulation are the so-called ban the box laws, and I'll talk more about those in just a moment. Um, and finally, many states uh, have their own non-discrimination laws. Um, and, and some of those include prohibitions on arrest or conviction record discrimination. Here in Wisconsin, for example, the State Fair Employment Act here um, only allows an employer to consider that criminal history if it's substantially related to the position at issue. And in other states that have similar laws, uh, it's a fairly common or a fairly similar standard. A New York, for example, instead of substantially related, um, has a um, you know directly related type analysis that's very similar. So um, the ban the box laws. Um, for those that aren't that well acquainted yet, it's a reference to the old school job application on a piece of paper that has the box, so to speak, that requires the applicant to check if they have a criminal history. And so there's been a movement um, over the last few years by some very effective political advocacy groups and public interest groups to um, change the way in which employers uh, process, and more specifically, when they process and consider criminal history information in the application and recruitment process. So these state and local ban the box laws uh, essentially require that the employer not consider any criminal history until after a conditional offer of employment's been made. Rather than at the front of the process, it now in these states and municipalities has to happen at the very end of the interview uh, and screening process. The purpose of that, of course, is to highlight for the applicant that um, the employer in question is, is actually considering their criminal history. Um, and it is and could be the only reason why an offer gets withdrawn. Um, and it really forces, of course, then as a result, and that's the intent of these laws, employers to be prepared to justify uh, why they're withdrawing that offer of employment um, and force them to talk about it openly with, with the candidate. So the slide here shows the explosion of, of growth 
um, here with Ban the Box laws. So as of as of this month, 24 states and districts of, of Columbia have have some type of Ban the Box regulation, with nine of those states passing laws that generally apply um, to all private employers. Um, if you have more than you know just a handful of employees uh, and, and with all staffing companies on the phone, uh, you're probably considered a covered private employer in each of those nine states. Um, and it's not just little states um, that are passing these statewide ban the box laws. It's, it's some of the bigger states, you know, that, um, you know, the states in which cities like Chicago and, and the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, reside. So um, if that wasn't hard enough for multi-state employers um, to deal with, we have also seen an explosion of local and municipal level regulation of ban the box laws. And even though the slide says there's over a hundred cities and counties now with such laws, it, it's probably over 200. Uh, we just haven't had the time <laughs> recently to count them all up. It's an area of quickly developing law. So uh, particularly in the, in the uh, if you have employees in the state of California. Um, so what we did here for you at the bottom of the slide was provide a link to a pretty helpful ban the box resource. Um, it is an updated, occasionally updated resource that lists all of the state um, and local regulation with ban the box types of laws. And it's updated, as I said, on a pretty regular basis. It's maintained by a political adv advocacy group. Um, which is it's relevant, but I, you know, I've looked at their material long enough to know um, that it's, it's fairly well done. Um, so just by way of example, I know we have staffing companies from across the country on the call today, um, but I picked one state that has its own non-discrimination law that has a prohibition on arresting conviction record discrimination just as, a, as an example, because the states that do have a similar law have a very similar um, regulatory um, framework where the employer in question has to um, demonstrate that um, the conviction at issue or the pending arrest at issue is substantially related to the position that they're being considered for. Um, in Wisconsin and in other states, again, this is a very common um, concept and um, framework. So here on, on this slide, you can see the basically the three elements, the three questions and criteria that an employer has to consider when making this substantially related decision. Um, the first is whether the applicant's um, prior convictions are directly related to the position at issue, okay? Um, so for example, if the conviction was for um, drunk driving uh, in the position you're considering them for has no element of driving a vehicle, um, it's, there's a good chance it's not directly related. And in states that have this type of discrimination prohibition, um, you and or your client um, are going to put themselves at risk if that relationship between the conviction and the position at issue isn't there. Secondly, um, at least in Wisconsin, the position that you're considering them for has to put them in a situation uh, that gives them the kind of opportunity to reoffend, to make that same uh, mistake, commit that same crime. Um, and you can consider in Wisconsin and some other states too that have similar, law, similar laws, um, the potential risk of harm, not only to the employer's business, but also to others when looking at that criminal history. So I've got a couple of slides here um, that again are um, applying Wisconsin substantially related uh, law just for a very quick flavor of how, and these are very representative of how states are enforcing, um, interpreting these types of laws. So in this first case on this slide, the conviction was found to be not substantially related. And the conviction at issue here was 
uh, possession with intent to deliver a controlled substance. Um, and in that case, the, the employer family dollar stores chose not to hire this person on that basis, and uh, they, they believed that, you know, uh, it showed a uh, propensity to, to unlawfully possess and sell legal drugs at the workplace, um, even though the, the conviction was uh, for selling drugs um, outside of the workplace. So there, was, there wasn't that connection. Um, and the court, as you can see, or the regulatory agency, excuse me, involved here, found it was not substantially related to the position, which was being a shelf stocker um, at a family dollar store. So that, was, that conviction was not substantially related. The next case here, um, the conviction at issue was for disorderly conduct. Um, this one is a closer call based on the facts. This one's a little more, a little more interesting, a little more challenging. That's why we added it in. Um, so here, the candidate had a uh, criminal, non-criminal conviction for disorderly conduct. Just a note on that: in Wisconsin, disorderly conduct it can be um, a non-criminal charge, or depending on how severe it is, it can be criminal. Um, either way, the, there was a, a conviction which resulted, which involved um, a domestic violence dispute. Um, where the applicant, a woman, was defending herself uh, against the father of her child and was using a knife to do so. So she ended up with a disorderly conviction on her record. Uh, she then applied to be a CNA at a long-term care facility um, that takes care of elderly and infirm um, patients. Um, so, you know, a vulnerable set of customers population. And in this case, the regulatory agency said that conviction was not substantially related to the position at issue. Um, and the basis was the underlying disorderly conduct conviction only happened um, in the eyes of the regulatory agency work here in the context of a domestic dispute. It, it only happened because of the emotional and personal connection of the parties involved. Compared, contrasted with the fact that this is a position where the applicant would be interacting with um, patients and residents of a facility that she didn't know, right? So there, there wouldn't be this same opportunity um, for domestic dispute related violence. So the conviction was not substantially related. The next one, um, very, I think this is a, a very different circumstance. I think it's an easier call. Um, should give employers in Wisconsin a little bit of relief and in states that have similar laws like the state of New York. Um, here the underlying conviction uh, was for forgery. Um, and the position at issue was being a, uh, a, a, an order filler at a retail distribution center. So in other words, that position would involve um, documenting inventory, um, some work with invoices. In other words, lots of opportunities to engage in deception, to lie, um, you know, and, and doing so while working with, with paper documents and electronic documents. So that was related enough um, that the employer at issue here, Walmart, could use that conviction to um, withdraw the offer of employment. It was substantially related. And finally, our last example here is a conviction, um, an applicant conviction of theft in a business setting, um, and the person was um, a phlebotomist drawing, drawing blood working in a medical facility. So um, the, the, the kind of controlling factor in the eyes of the enforcement agency here was that the applicant would have relatively easy access to large amounts of cash. Um, so there would be 
plenty of opportunity to engage in that same type of criminal activity theft. So there the conviction was found to be substantially related. So before I open things up to, um, to questions and comments, a couple of quick notes on building the right background check process. And this kind of acts as a little bit of a summary here of the amount of material we've covered already um, in a pretty quick order. So um, most importantly is, is knowing the relevant laws. And sometimes that's not as evident as you may think, particularly with the explosion of state and local laws. If you are, as I said, an employer in California, there's a very good chance just on the issue of ban the box regulation that there is a ban the box uh, ordinance uh, or, or county uh, ordinance that applies to you. Um, it's worth investigating and checking that out. Secondly, pick a compliant third party consumer reporting agency and, and other providers too that might be in any way involved with your background checks um, and the whole process. So you want to, and we advise our temporary staffing clients here at the law firm to only work with CRAs that have made significant investments in compliance resources. And those, um, those fortunately, those CRAs are, are generally pretty well known. Um, they're, they're the ones that tend to put on um, compliance uh, webinars and seminars uh, of their own. Um, because the key point here is it's your responsibility and liability as the employer. No matter what the, um, the salesperson and the marketing materials may say from the, the CRA provider, um, it's your responsibility at the end of the day. So you really want to partner with providers that know what they're doing and stand behind their work. Third, conduct individualized assessments. That's the safest route. I know it's time consuming. I know it's not as fast as applying, you know, a formulaic metric, uh, matrix, for example, um, but it's gonna go a long way to keeping you off uh, a target list, either of the EEOC or private plaintiff uh, groups. So, um, in other presentations on background checks where I have a little bit more time, we, we talk about uh, the use of different formulas and matrix for criminal history consideration. Uh, and maybe you have a client or two or several that still use these, um, where, for example, they may use a point system um, that says if you have a felony conviction for X, Y, or Z, that's two points. If, it's, if that occurred in the last two years, it's an extra three points. And you'd have to do that for all of their criminal convictions, and you come up with a point total. And, you know, the client's got this matrix that says, if the applicant has this many points or more, don't send them to us. We are not going to consider him or her no matter what. Um, so there's a virtually limitless number of formulas and, and matrix that, that, can, that can be and, and sometimes are used. Um, take your time if you've got a client who's either encouraging you or requiring you to use their formula that they've designed. Um, you know, that's your responsibility to look at it and, and, and really consider um, is it, um, in its spirit consistent with the EEOC's view that an individualized assessment is actually happening, happening with, each, with each applicant. Um, and um, finally, beware of the Fair Credit Reporting Act and its, its sister uh, FCRAs at the, at the state level, particularly in California, which has additional processes um, aside from those required under the federal law. So um, the last thing I'll say about building the right process, and again, this is um, this one slide is a summary of an entire 
hour long presentation of its own. So forgive me a bit for generalizing, but I wanted to add it in here at the very end um, because it's becoming increasingly common um, and that is the use of social media during the recruitment consideration process. Um, you know, this is a way, a great example of the way in which the employment law world has changed um, over the years and, and when a lot of these employment laws were written, um, sometimes as far back as the 1930s, um, the internet and, and social media certainly weren't even contemplated. So what we have now, particularly staffing companies and recruiting companies, you've probably heard stories of you know, situations where a recruiting company or staffing company sent a candidate over, uh, assigned a, a temporary employee um, to a client, and um, he or she starts working, and, and someone at the client site, typically in the HR department, maybe Googles him or her and finds out, oh, my gosh, you know, this is a convicted murderer. Um, and, you know, the, that murder occurred in a workplace, oh, my gosh, what did our staffing company just do to us? Why is he here? Did our staffing company even bother to check um, online? You know, this information, so much information is readily available um, to the entire world and certainly all of us on the telephone. So you can see from a client perspective, I think um, based on our work with our staffing clients here, um, their customers, your customers, have a much higher expectation that you and your staff are considering at least some information about an applicant um, that, that's on the Internet. Um, you know, that at the very least maybe you've, you've looked at their LinkedIn profile, um, maybe they have a Twitter account, um, you know, it's information that they have decided to share with the world on the Internet and, you know, to what extent should you as an employer incorporate that information into your decision. So there are a lot of benefits, and this, these are just a few here on the slide, to considering and, you know, gathering that information and then taking it into consideration. Um, and, and one that's not listed here, we had to cut off would fit on the single slide is what I just mentioned. That's really client expectation, right? So um, that it, it's, it weighs heavily these days. And I think what we see anecdotally here is many more employers using some type of online information gathering um, than ever before. So it's it's happening much more now. So. On the downside, right, the, the risks at the bottom of the slide here, um, there, you, you've got to be careful, right? There, there are a host of laws that can be implicated um, based on the information that, that can be gathered via social media or just generally online. Anti-discrimination laws, right? If, if someone has broadcast to the world um, that their religion is a certain type or they have a certain disability, um, sexual orientation, political beliefs, things along those lines. Um, lawful off-duty conduct laws, and they're typically um, at the state level. Um, those are laws that say, for example, um, an employer can't take adverse action against you because of some conduct you're engaged in that's lawful, right? It's off-duty, but it's lawful, and they can't consider that in their employment decisions. So an example of that is um, in North Carolina, they, you know, uh, if you're a smoker, um, a, a, an employer in North Carolina can't hold that against you, so to speak, um, when they're considering you for employment. The Fair Credit Reporting Act, again, is implicated if you're using social media, if you're relying on a third-party provider to gather that social media information for you. There's a host of password protection laws out there now that prohibit an employer from requiring a candidate or an employee to give up uh, their online password as a condition of the job search. So some, some great examples there. I know I rushed through that slide a, a little quicker maybe than, um, than I wanted to, but I wanted to add it in. 
before we open things up to, to questions. So uh, the remaining slides are just a little bit more information um, about our law firm here. So Amanda, I'd love to open it up to questions. Wonderful. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, go ahead and use the chat or the Q&A feature, and then I will read off the questions for Mike to answer for us. I will move through some of the slides here and also open up a poll for you to give us your feedback on today's session. I do have a question that has come in. Um, what are the most common mistakes staffing companies make with background checks? Yeah, I, I would say um, that the, the most common is not knowing which laws and regulations apply and, and just making some assumptions about that. So um, particularly as it relates to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, you know, there's, and that's a painful one to make mistakes on for the reasons I mentioned, liability and penalties add up extremely quickly there. So you need to be extremely careful. Make sure you're in a state um, where, I'm sorry, Amanda, can you hear me right now? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Make sure you, you know the laws in the state and locality where your applicant is located. So, for example, you might have, um, you might not have an office in San Francisco, California, um, but if you've got an applicant who resides there, you need to know and you need to be working with a CRA that, that knows the laws in, in California. So that's, that's a good example. Um, and then I think the, the other most common mistake is thinking that you as a staffing company can um, assign away your liability for complying with these various laws. So you may sign something with a service provider and it may, might make you feel good, but at the end of the day, again, that's your responsibility. Good question. Okay. Um, what should staffing companies with employees in multiple states do in order to comply with the different be on the box laws? Right. So I would imagine that a fair number of the folks on the call today have employees in many different states. And as a result, you have to deal with that challenge of varying states, uh, varying state laws. And so there's different approaches and, and there isn't a right one or a wrong one. It, it's really up to your organization to decide. Um, you need to take a look at each of the laws um, in each of the states where you are that, that have such a ban the box law and, and look at what it requires. Um, how onerous is it or how easy is it to comply with? And how expensive administratively, operationally for you internally, would it be to have a separate onboarding and recruitment process, um, you know, that varies state to state? Um, you know, do you want to try and attempt to have, you know, if you have employees in 24 different states that have banned the box laws, do you want to try and have a slightly different process for each of those um, or, you know, at the other end of the spectrum in terms of approaches, it might just be easier for you um, to have a single uh, process for considering criminal history. You know, if, if you're in enough states and municipalities that have a ban the box ordinance or law, maybe it's, it's better and easier for you to simply um, assume that you are in the most employee friendly of those 24 states and have that be your process across the country, across every single office. And if for what it's worth, we, we see more of our multi-state employers, you know, moving towards that single process model where the most employee friendly 
law is the one that's presumed to be um, in force for for every and all situations across all of their offices. Okay. Um, does the Spokio court decision mean that employers no longer need to worry about minor Fair Credit Reporting Act violations? Wow, great question. That means someone was paying really close attention. Um, um, the Spokio decision is very important and it's, it's very employer favorable. Um, we as an employer community could have been hit pretty hard with a, a decision that went in the other direction. Um, but the answer to the question is you, no, you can't really relax. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a helpful decision, but it's really unclear how um, other courts are going to interpret this new standing requirement, um, which requires the, the plaintiff to show more than just a theoretical uh, injury for the employer's noncompliance. Um, we've got, um, actually on our law firm website, we have a blog post um, from a, a, about a month or two ago on the Spokio decision that gets into the details a little bit more for, for any folks that want to dig a little bit further. And of course, my contact information is on one of the slides here. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and you should feel free to, sh to shoot an email or, or give a call um, at your convenience and, and we'll try and help you out. That's always an option. Wonderful. Well, if there are any other further questions, you can go ahead and submit them now, or you can um, certainly reach out to either Mike or myself directly uh, after the presentation today for a more one-on-one uh, -on -one question. If you have something um, that comes up in your background check process that you would like to ensure um, you know, that you're meeting compliance, uh, Mike's a, a great resource for you. Uh, again, our contact information is up on the screen, and a few people have already asked um, for copies of the PowerPoint presentation, which I will send out to those who have requested it after today's session has concluded. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today, and Mike for sharing your knowledge about background checks, uh, changing laws, and increasing litigation. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation um, slides will be available after the session. The uh, webinar recording of today's event will be available on our website at tricom.com. It's under the Resources and Industry Insider Webinar Series tab. Uh, thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Have a fantastic day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.